Welcome to Cornerstone Online. We are excited you decided to join us today. We would like to thank you for your continued generosity during this time. To give online, download the Give Plus app or follow the Give Online link on our website. Thanks again for listening today. We hope to see you in person soon. Does it seem to you that people are more, more and more easily offended than they used to be? I was reading about microaggressions last week, and I, I kind of like this explanation. It says that micro or microaggressions are statements that are usually positive, but vague enough that the person can't rightly feel insulted and doesn't know how to respond. I saw a book advertised on Amazon. It was entitled, The Things That Aren't Offensive, The Complete List. And the ad for the book said, The world is a sensitive place. We must do our best to never offend anyone ever. If you aren't sure whether something is offensive or not, use this book as your ultimate guide. If something is not listed in this book, then it is most definitely offensive, and you should be ashamed of yourself. (laughs) And as near as I could tell, all the pages were blank in that book. Satire. So who would you say is the most offended person in existence? And I'm not talking about things, I'm not at all talking about things like Mr. Potato Head, who is the most offended? I think it's God. God, the God of the Bible. Yeah, God created a beautiful world and a garden and created Adam and Eve and put them in that beautiful garden. There was only one prohibition that we know of, and that was do not eat of this certain tree, the fruit of this certain tree. And so what did they do? They ate of that tree tree. They did exactly what God told them not to do. Fast forward a little ways. uh, Adam and Eve have two children. Those children grow up. And uh, do you have a brother or sister? Do you know anything about sibling rivalry? Well, the rivalry got so bad between these two guys, Cain and Abel, that, uh, I mean, and you wouldn't believe the thing that they were upset about. It was their worship of God. Have you ever known anybody to get upset, just really upset and mad at somebody else because of the way they want to worship God? And it got so bad that Cain burned with anger and he wanted to kill his brother. And God came to him and warned him about where his thoughts were going to take him. But he defied God and he just went ahead and killed his brother anyway. The time went on and People kept on turning their back on God and ignoring God and defying God and mocking God. And this is what it says in Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. So what did God do? He sent a flood and a flood and he wiped out all mankind on the earth except for Noah and his family, who had found favor in the eyes of the Lord. However, as time went by, man again rebelled against God, defied God, built the Tower of Babel to make a name and into the heavens, to make a name for themselves and to challenge God. And so God confused their language and scattered them. Now, throughout history, we're going to see all kinds of evidence of people betraying God's goodwill, uh, uh, mocking God, defying God, rebelling against God. Is that still happening today? Well, yes, absolutely it is. And in fact, people today do everything that people did before them, but then also people today are coming up with new ways to defy God and mock God. So God said... I I created two genders, male and female. And people today are saying, oh, no, no, God is wrong. There are many new and different genders. God is wrong. And God said that marriage is between a man and a woman. And people today say, oh, no, 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 God is wrong. A marriage can be between two men or two women or however you want to do it. It's okay. 
because they defy God. They mock God. They do what they want to do. So what is, what is God going to do? Will he send a flood and wipe out mankind like he did before? Or will he send down fire from heaven and burn up all the evil like he did with Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, God would rather be at peace with people rather than just wiping them all out every few generations. So in, in spite of everything that the people have done, God wants to spare us because ultimately he loves us. So there is hope for the liar and the cheater and the hater and the murderer and all those, those kinds of sins that people get themselves involved in, there is hope for sinners, even like you and me. And Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians how this works. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So what we see here is that God is taking on himself the work of reconciliation. The one who is wronged, God, is taking the initiative and making a way for the ones who have perpetrated the wrong to be reconciled. That's not, that's not usually the way it happens. That's not, not usually the way, at least with people, that's not how it's done. The offended is the one who waits for the other person to come to them. And, you know, many people in this world, they, they just vastly underestimate how serious a thing it is to be at odds with God. You know, this is not a minor misunderstanding that's easily resolved. When people turn their back on God, the creator and the owner of this universe, well, they're setting themselves up as God. Sin is no less than mutiny. And, and God is not going to allow mutineers to get away with their mutiny. He's not going to be a victim to mere human beings. Now, a person might be a mutineer and be a very nice person. They might be a person that even when, when they get into a jam, they, they might pray to God and ask him or for someone else to get them or somebody else out of a jam. I mean, that person might be well and good in many ways, get along well in society. That's fine. But the punishment for sin is death. However, God has made a way for sinners, mutineers, to be reconciled to him. And let me assure you that it's not the way of God just overlooking our sin. Now, people sometimes overlook things. They know that they've been wrong, they just overlook it. They know that a crime is committed, committed, they just overlook it. You're sitting at a stoplight, the light turns green, people are turning, making a left-hand turn in front of you, blocking you from proceeding, and of course they're, they're doing that when they have the green light, but then they keep on turning when they have the red light. So you want to go forward because now you have the green light, and these people are still two, three, four, maybe cars going ahead of you, and you can't get out in the intersection because they just keep on coming with a red light. They're running a red light. And you think, wow, it's too bad there's not a police officer around here. And then you look and see, well, there's a police officer right there. And what does he do or she do? Nothing. They just, they overlook it. A lot of things are overlooked. Recently, there's been a significant drop in arrests on offenses like vandalism, crimes against property, among the prison population. There is a lot of inmate-on-inmate inmate crime. What happens? Pretty much nothing. It's just overlooked. People overlook wrongs, crimes, sins. God is not like that. To overlook 
a wrong is an injustice, and God is a just God. He is not going to let the guilty go unpunished. So if God is not going to overlook our sins, then how in the world are we going to be reconciled to God? Well, humanly speaking, it's impossible. There's no way that we can devise a plan. There's no way that we can do enough good deeds. There's no, there's no way that we can sacrifice something. There, there's just no way that we can be reconciled to God on our own, by our own efforts. Now, in our relationships here on earth, if we are at odds with somebody, we can, we can apologize to them, we can make it up to them, we can get them a gift, we can send them a card, we can oh, maybe uh, get down on our knees and beg, we can try to make them laugh, we can sing a song to them, we can write a poem for them. None of that is going to work with God. But this is how it happens. Verse 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So who is this person? This him who had no sin. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus had no sin, absolutely no sin. He wasn't a sinner at all. So during Jesus' trial, Pilate said three times, I find no fault in this man. One of the thieves that was on the cross alongside of Jesus said, he's done nothing wrong. The centurion who was in charge of the crucifixion said, surely this man was a righteous man. People who met Jesus, who were around Jesus, they they knew. I mean, everybody knew that this guy is righteous. He is holy. He is, they may not have realized sinless, but everybody who came around Jesus realized that this person is completely different than the typical man. And in fact, the Bible teaches that he was in fact sinless. Isaiah, the prophet, foretold what was going to happen. He said he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds are we healed. So God had this great miracle that he worked, and our sins are gone, and Christ died, but then he rose again, and he's glorified. So everybody's happy, right? And that's the end of it, right? No, there's more to it. We, you and I, as Christians, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 18, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, he has committed to us a message of reconciliation. Verse 20, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. So you are an ambassador from heaven to a foreign land. The foreign land is earth. You know, this this world really is not our home. Our home is in heaven. We are here as ambassadors, representatives. Now, when an ambassador goes into a foreign land, the ambassador just doesn't do whatever they want to do and say whatever they want to say. They They do and they say according to what the governing body back in their home country has dictated that they do and say, has sent them with a message. And in this case, that would be God. God has commissioned us to be his ambassadors. We represent him here on this foreign land, which is earth, our temporary home, but not our permanent home. The purpose of any church is to produce men and women who would be faithful to God, followers of Jesus Christ, who would represent God and his message of reconciliation here on this earth. This world is going to pass away. And you and I have been given the responsibility, the joy, though, of telling people that there is a better place. Now, you might be skeptical of reconciliation. You might think, well, people don't even want to be reconciled. Or you might think, well, I don't have a very good example of reconciliation. Well, one-third of the book of Genesis is devoted to the story of one person and reconciliation. It shows that human-to-human reconciliation is possible, and it's also held up, I believe, as an illustration of, Another way of looking at the idea of God reconciling man to himself. 
Now, Jacob, also called Israel in the Bible, had 12 sons. And it was wrong, it was totally wrong, but Jacob was one of those parents that played favorites. And Joseph was his favorite. There was no question about it. He didn't even try to hide it from his other sons. And so his other sons grew to hate their brother Joseph. And in fact, it says in Scripture that they hated him so much that they could not say a kind word to him. Eventually, they wanted to kill him. And when they got the chance, they almost did, except then they decided that, okay, instead of killing him and taking his clothes back to dad and saying that he was killed by a wild animal, what we'll do is we'll sell him into slavery. Now, many of us may have a brother or a sister, or we, we might have children of our own. And a lot of research has been done on sibling relationships, and including rivalry and fighting. And according to some research, children between the ages of 2 and 4 have an average of 6.2 fights per hour. Now, if these children take a really long nap during the day, I mean, wouldn't that be nice? They still are going to have somewhere between 70 and 90 fights every day. And if you are at home watching over children, it's no wonder you're tired. You know, it's one thing to have disagreements, disagreements even that, that last for years. It's another thing to hate somebody so much that you want to kill them or you want to sell them to a human trafficker. So fast forward 13 years through Joseph's life. During those 13 years, he, he was made into a slave. He was sold as a slave to an Egyptian. Through no fault of his own, he is thrown into prison, falsely accused. And think about this. You're, you're sitting in prison. If that was you, how wounded would you be? Most of your family, I mean your brothers, except for your, your dad, hated you wanted to kill you, sold you into slavery. Now you're sitting in prison through no fault of your own. Has anybody here ever been wronged like Joseph? Anybody listening can say, okay, I, yeah, I've suffered a lot more than Joseph did. Would you want to have revenge? I mean, do we think about that? Revenge on people who wrong us. So anyway, by the hand of God, he comes out of the prison, eventually rose to second in command in Egypt, only below Pharaoh himself. A famine hit the land. But because he was in a, power, a powerful position, he was able to interpret dreams and foresee this famine coming. And so he stored up a lot of food for people in Egypt and actually enough for the entire region. And so, guess who now comes to get food for their family? <laughs> his brothers. And now he has his chance. Now he can get revenge. Now he can do whatever he wants to with his brothers. And in one of the most tender moments in, in the entire Bible, Joseph forgives his brothers. He says, you meant these things for evil, but God meant them for good. And I, I really like the way John Ortberg puts it. Joseph was hated by his brothers, sold into slavery, suffered in an Egyptian prison, then rose to power at just the right time to save the people of Israel. He became a hero. But make no mistake about it, Joseph's greatest heroic act is not about interpreting dreams or about rising to the position of second in command, or even about feeding a starving nation. His greatest heroic act was forgiveness. The Almighty God of heaven created this world, everything in the world, the amazing flora and fauna, the amazing diversity of animals and the universe and the stars hung the stars in the sky. He created all of this and mankind. 
as the crown of his creation. But the greatest and most amazing, awesome thing that God ever did was when he decided to forgive and forget. When he decided he was going to reconcile man, mankind, men and women, sinners, rebels, mutineers, to himself. He was going to make a way for them to come to him. And that's our message. Our message to this lonely, hurting, offending, and offended people. Reconciliation. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for this amazing truth that we have here, for this plan that you devised. We couldn't ever have come up with this. We could never have found a way to be reconciled, but you made a way. And Father, thank you for that wonderful Savior we have in Jesus Christ. And I pray this in his name. Amen.